All right, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to talk a little bit about chaos. So chaos, let me give you a, a little bit of background of where that word comes from. It's a, it's a Greek word originally, and it means chasm or void. That's what the, the actual transliteration means. But it's used, it's applied as a state of extreme unrest, confusion, pandemonium, disorder, havoc, turmoil, anarchy, frenzy, and weakness due to instability. You don't have to look very far to see that in our world today. Everything seems to be in chaos. And we're going we're gonna to kind of work our way through this. But, but the word appears in Scripture in, in various forms. For instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, David describes it this way. He says, When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, and the snares of death prevented me. The picture here is, is of utter chaos, fear, and terror. Okay? During the reign of Asa, uh, the prophet Azariah reminded the king of what life was like outside of God's will, outside of God's presence, so to speak. And it says here in 2 Chronicles 15, 5, it says, In those days there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in. For great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. In other words, chaos is pictured as, a, pictured as a, an uncontrollable storm, as a tempest that destroys everything in its path. And we have seen a lot of chaos in our world. We have seen it run rampant in our nation since the beginning of the year. Between uh, the virus and the, the quarantine, uh, now the civil unrest and the rioting in the streets, each morning I wake up and I find it more and more difficult to recognize the country that I grew up in uh, because of what's taking place in the world. Who would have thought back in January that our entire country would sh be shut down for months? Who would have even thought about that? Or that a new contagion would kill over, over 100,000 people in the course of, of just a couple of months? Or, or, or that more than 30 million jobs would just disappear? And the experts are saying that 46% of them will probably never come back. Who would have thought about that when we entered 2020 with hope for a new year and, and maybe some stability and maybe, some, some, maybe a different year than, than years past? Who would have believed that you would turn on the news and see thousands of people rioting in hundreds of cities around our nation? Who would have even, who would have even thought that? I would have thought that. Bizarre. When in the history of our nation was it ever not okay to shake someone's hand or to give a hug? When? I can't think of a time in history. I love history. I can't think of a time when we've ever been in a situation quite like this. When did the police become the bad guys and the anarchists become the heroes? I don't know. It's a crazy world. When... When did criminal activity become the way to honor a man who was wrongfully killed? Wrongfully killed, but criminal activity to honor him, that, it seems like an oxymoron. Fear, hate, violence, corruption, death, prejudice, uh, 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 sin uh, is spreading like wildfire through our nation. And I've learned something uh, as I look through all of this as I, as I witness things transpiring in our country, I, I've learned something. I've learned that chaos is contagious. Chaos is very contagious. It spreads. It goes from one person to another. It starts out small like a virus, an unseen virus, and, and, and spreads. It starts out as a, a single brick being thrown. It starts out as, as hate in the heart of, a, of an individual and just continues to spread. <laughs> chaos is contagious. And chaos has three main symptoms, and those are contagious too. Fear, hate, and worry. Fear, hate. Chaos breeds fear, hate, and worry. And what I want to do today is, uh, what, do we, what do we do about it? What is a biblical response to what's going on in our world today? 
So we're going to look here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse 2. It says, We give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God our Father, and I hear this, ready? Your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, beloved of God, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power uh, and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you have become imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word, get, look at the contrast here, in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples of, to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and, and, and in the midst of crazy chaos, it feels like we are in the midst of a crazy storm. And Lord, we don't know where it's going to end. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's, what's going to happen next. It seems like our entire nation is sitting on a, on a powder keg just ready to explode. Fortunately, we know that you are in control. You are on the throne. And we can trust in you. Lord, today as we look at the church of Thessalonica and how they responded to the chaos that they experienced, help us, your people today, some 2,000 years later, Help us, Lord, to deal in the same way. We love you. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is written to the church at Thessalonica. Okay, it was a good church. Uh, it tells us they received the word with both affliction and great joy. I don't know about you, but those sound like two completely different emotions, two completely different uh, uh, mindsets. How can you be afflicted? And still have joy. Well, uh, these people, uh, one describes the, the outward chaos. That's the affliction. There was chaos going on around them. But internally, where Christ resides, where the Holy Spirit took up residence in these people's lives, there was great joy. I know from the world's perspective, it makes no sense. In, in the world's perspective, the only way I could be happy is if everything's going right. But that's not joy. Joy is an aspect of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's something that comes from the inside out. That's something that comes, that happens no matter what's going on around us. The world could be falling apart. But the Holy Spirit still is able to produce joy in our hearts. We know that uh, chaos was spreading in this city, Thessalonica. Uh, Paul and Silas had, Paul and Silas, they were going to the temple for three weeks straight. Three, three Sabbaths in a row preaching the word of God, and the people received it willingly, and they were, they were hungry. You ever meet somebody who's hungry to learn something? It, it's a pleasure to be around them. It's a pleasure to, to, to feed. It's a pleasure, you know, like let's say you're doing something that, that your, your, your son or your daughter really likes, and they are excited about it. Well, you, you like doing that, and that's how these people were. They were so excited, but there were some people that were not so happy, and it says in Acts chapter 17, Verse 5, that the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked, I want you to, I want you to hear how this is worded, okay? Because this is, this is what's going on in Thessalonica before Paul writes the letter to the Thessalonians, okay? It says, these Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out into the crowd. This was not a peaceful protest. Uh, in our country, we have, uh, under our Constitution, we have the ability, the, 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 the blessing of being able to gather. It's, an, it's, a, it's a constitutional right in peaceful protest to whatever's going on. Nothing wrong with that. But when it turns ugly, when it turns violent, this is what you get. And, and you know, Antifa is not some new thing. It was happening, 
the mindset was happening 2,000 years ago. They had a mob and the mob mentality and chaos spread in this, this group. And they actually went to Jason's house and they were saying, we want the apostles. Bring them out here. We're going to take care of it. We're going we're gonna to fix this. We don't like the fact that you're preaching Jesus Christ. And they got this, you know, you ever remember, remember those, um, remember the old uh, black and white uh, uh, horror movies, Frankenstein in particular, right? And then, you know, Frankenstein the monster, not, not Frankenstein the doctor was weird, was weird too, but they were, Frankenstein the monster, everybody was afraid of. And, and the, the people in the village, all of a sudden, before you know it, bam, they all have torches and they're all going to get the monster. A mob mentality. That's what happened then. That's what's happening today. Not everybody. There are peaceful protests going on. And, and, I, and, and I, I'm, as, a, as a, somebody who, who loves our Constitution, I'm, I'm okay with that. When it turns ugly, when it turns violent, when wicked people in their cowardly, selfish way seek to take advantage of tenuous situations and add fuel to the fire just to get their own way, well, that's when it gets ugly. That's when things turn from something that is really good and supported by our Constitution to something that is really bad. That's when it goes from something good uh, that, that is, is biblically okay to something that is not. Okay? And that's what's happening here. So we have this, this ugly situation going on in Thessalonica. But we need to know how did they respond? Because we read that there was much affliction but great joy. Well, how did they get to that point? Well, 1 Thessalonians 1.3 has the answer for us. It says, remember before our God and Father your work of faith and your labor of love and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of chaos, the church shined. And, and I want you to get this today. Okay? While everything was falling down apart, uh, around them, the church shine the church stood out it says that their faith was spread not just through macedonia and archaea okay but everywhere because of how they responded and and if you get one thing today if you get one thing today please get this we do not go to church if you're a child of god you do not go to church i don't go to church we are the church. There's a completely different, that changes everything. Unfortunately, we live in a society of, of uh, you know, buffet, a buffet-minded society where people hop and shop and this way and that way and, and, you know, looking for something, looking to get something or, or that's not church. We don't, I since I've been saved, since I've known Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I have never gone to church, ever. I became part of the church. There's a difference there. There's a huge difference there. One of them is a, uh, um, an interested observer. Okay, I can go to a movie, but I'm not in the movie. You see this face? They're not going to put it in a movie. Okay, when I go to the movie, don't agree that too quick. He agreed way too quick for that. He's over here shaking his head like, oh, you're right about that. My wife's okay, though. My wife thinks I can. I can go to a movie. I can go to a restaurant. I can go places and go to things. But that's not what the church is. I become part of the body of Christ. We become part of one another. And that's what happened in Thessalonica. <laughs> they did not just go to church. They owned it. They heard Paul and Silas preaching, and they were like, that makes me alive. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in my life and has brought me and put me as a part of something greater than just myself, bigger than me. And that's what was going on there. And that's why they were able to receive uh, the word in affliction, but with great joy, with great joy. You see, we need to be contagious. We need to be contagious. Uh, it's been estimated that there are over 380 trillion viruses and uh, bacteria, different, bacteria, different viruses, different bacteria, in our bodies, inhabiting us. 
it's a community. They actually call it, it's a community that's collectively known as the human virome. V-I-R-O-M-E. The human virome. And it's a community of viruses and bacteria. And they are contagious. <laughs> there are viruses on our skin. There are viruses in our lungs, on our cells, in our blood. They are everywhere, and they are contagious. However, they're not all bad. They're not all bad for us. Uh, some of them we actually need. Some of them uh, actually kill harmful bacteria and kill harmful viruses. Uh, when you contract the virus as a young person, as a child, it strengthens your immune system to be able to fight viruses when you get older. They're not all bad, but they are all contagious. Okay? And uh, you and I, we cannot help it. We're carriers of these viruses. So think about that. Inside of you and me, there's 380 trillion different viruses and bacteria, and, and they're living organisms. They kind of, first of all, I looked at it, it kind of creeped me out a little bit. Okay? But the truth is, you're not just what's sitting in a chair. There's a whole lot going on inside of you and on top of you and, and around you and in you and through you. And it's not just viruses that we carry. We carry a whole lot more. And, and, and we're going to be contagious, not just in the viruses and the bacteria, but we're going to be contagious in other things that we carry. Uh, our words, our actions, our thoughts, our feelings, what we bring to, into the world. And here's the big question. Is what you are carrying worth catching? That's what it boils down to. Is what you're carrying worth catching? Because remember, not all the viruses were bad. Not all the bacteria is bad. Some of it was good. And some of the things that you and I carry as a church, as a body of believers... Some of it's bad. Some of the most horrific things in history have been, been done in the name of religion. That's not good. Some of the nastiest words that have been said have been done from, been said by, by religious people. But some of the best things in history have also been carried by the church, by believers, true believers in Christ. Who, who have the Holy Spirit in them, who is also contagious. And we've got to ask ourselves, is what I'm carrying, because I'm carrying, is what I'm carrying worth catching? Well, we're going we're gonna to take a look at how that maps out here, because 2,000 years ago, as chaos spread in Thessalonica, so did the actions of the church. Uh, these believers were carriers of three contagions that countered fear, hate, and worry, and they're called faith, love, and hope. These are the direct counterparts. Call them, call them uh, uh, antiviruses. Call them antibody. Call them whatever you want. They are in direct opposition to what, remember we said chaos spreads these three contagions, uh, fear, hate, and worry. As believers, we carry the antiviruses to them. And our, uh, is what we're carrying, is it worth catching? Well, let's break it down. Uh, first of all, we need to activate our faith, because the, the, the first one is faith. We need to activate our faith. First Thessalonians 1, 3 says, Remember before our God and Father your work of faith. We don't have, what we have, you and I don't have to work to get to heaven. You guys understand that, right? I want to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. We don't work our way into heaven. There's nothing I can do to be good enough to enter the purity of heaven. You say, wow, that's pretty harsh. No, that's reality. And, and we're, we're lacking a, 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 a good dose of reality in our world today. Uh, people don't want to see the truth. Well, the truth is, I am rotten to the core without Christ. Compared to the purity of heaven. Now, I might be better than the guy down the street from a human perspective. You know, he might be some wacky, crazy person that's just mean and... and, and and, and, and horrible and, you know, uh, um, beats his wife on Tuesday nights because that's wife beating night. And, you know, on Wednesdays it's his kids. And, you know, and, and, and he, he lets his crab grass crawl over into my yard. And, you know, he could be all of these things, okay? I, I, I didn't mean to associate the crab grass. That's kind of a small thing compared to beating your wife and kids. But you know what I mean, okay? You know what I mean. He's just a rotten guy. And compared to him, 
I'm pretty good. I don't beat my wife. I don't beat my kids. I do have crabgrass that spreads out. Other than that, I don't I, 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 compared to him, I'm not a bad guy. But compared to Jesus, I'm worse than that guy. Because Jesus is perfection, complete purity. And when it comes down to it, when we stand before the gates of heaven, God's going to look at us, the Father's going to look at us and say, hey, did you do a bunch of good things? Did you give a bunch of money to the church? Did you, did you uh, um, um, pet little puppies and kiss little babies? Well, come on into heaven. No, that's not going to happen. He's going to say, what have you done with my son? How have you responded to my son that I sent to die for your sins? So we don't have a, a works-based based faith, but we do. We need to have a faith that works. Our faith needs to be activated. It needs to do something. What does that mean? Well, when we both believe and actively trust in the guidance of the Word of God and the leading of the Spirit of God, we are, uh, are actively walking in faith. We are actively working our faith. Okay? It's a very big difference. And uh, as we walk by faith, our fear goes into its proper perspective. Because, again, fear is the antivirus, uh, faith is the antivirus to fear. When I'm walking by faith, it is the antivirus to fear. It comes into perspective. Does it mean my fear is going to completely disappear? Not necessarily. There's a lot going on in the world. And I'll be honest with you. When it's, if, if uh, in the city of Pittsburgh, if there's crazy riots everywhere, guess where I'm not going? City of Pittsburgh. I'm not, you know, well, I'm going to go to the city of Pittsburgh because that's where I want to go and I'm, I'm, I'm courageous. And, no, that's, that's, not, that's not good. That's not good, because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to be part of the problem, okay? So faith is the antithesis. Faith is the antivirus to fear. And, and, you know, our confidence and our courage in the Lord grows to a point where we no longer waver, we no longer hesitate, we're no longer paralyzed by indecision. That's the power of a faith that works. Take a look at 1 John chapter 5, beginning of verse 4. It says, for everyone who has been born of God, what does he do? What happens? Overcomes the world. Now, this is not some violent thing. This is, this is overcoming the world system. We're no longer subject to it, okay? Um, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Our faith. A faith that works. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Faith is the direct counter to fear. And just as fear is contagious, so is faith. Is what you're carrying worth catching? Do you really believe what you believe? Now, that's not some tricky word thing. I want you to think about that. Do you really believe what you believe? Because if I really believe what I believe, it's going to manifest itself in my actions. It's going to manifest itself in how I deal with fear that comes into my life. We need to activate our faith. What else do we need to do? We need to demonstrate our love. We need to demonstrate our love. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 1.3 again. It says, remember before God and our Father your work of faith and your what? Your labor of love. All right, so, so this, is, this is a, um, this is a, a very common uh, technique that Paul uses in his writings. He does a progression. Labor is harder than work. In the Greek, the word labor means to toil to the point of exhaustion. <laughs> Let's get raw. There are some people that you love that exhaust you, yes? How many of you have somebody in your life that you love them, you know, you really do, but it's a lot of work, right? Right? Yeah, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I got more than one. Okay. I might be one. I probably am one. Okay. Um, labor is hard. And a labor of love is a love that works hard regardless. Sean used to call them uh, extra grace required people. Okay. And there are a lot of them. I am. You are at different points in our lives. Things that be coming into our lives. You know, nobody has, a, has it perfect. Nobody has it has a, 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 a free, free, free walk through this life. It's like, hey, everything's great. 
Mm. We face trouble. We face trials. We face tribulations. Jesus said that was going to happen. He told us. He warned us. So as Christians, how can we be surprised when things do happen that way? We shouldn't. Okay? We need to demonstrate our love. It's a work. Uh, it's not a work that gets us to heaven. It's a work because we're going to heaven. There's a huge difference there. Okay? When a person truly loves Jesus, he is inspired and driven to intense labor for Christ. And that manifests itself through obedience and through loving others. That's the, that's the evidence of love. If I tell my wife, I love you, and I tell her 30 times a day, but my actions are the opposite, that's not real love. That's fake. That's plastic. That's not a labor of love. That's not something that's going to be sounded out, and that's not something that's going to spread in a good way. Is what you're carrying worth catching? If my love for my wife is a fake, plastic, surface kind of love, that's not worth catching. It's not worth catching at all. Now, how does this happen? Well, the follower of Christ who is driven by love is the one who has seen the love of Christ in their own lives. Now, let me share this with you. Before I knew Jesus as Lord and Savior, I didn't really know what true love was. I'm just being honest. I saw some examples of it in the world, of what I thought was love. I had a picture in my mind of what love was supposed to look like, but I really didn't know. Because I didn't experience it. I didn't know it. But once Jesus came into my life, once I placed my faith, my hope, and my trust in him for heaven, and in him alone for heaven, and he took up residence in my life, and I realized what he did for me, and the love that he demonstrated on the cross, well, then I had no excuse. I knew what love was. And that's What's happening here? And then we, we, we can genuinely love. As a matter of fact, take a look at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It says, let love be genuine, abhor or hate or walk away from what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. When we demonstrate God's love, it comes from a real, genuine, deep place within us. It's not something that I can, I can stoke up. It's not something that I can make happen. It's something that happens as I surrender to God and he lives through me. Now, it doesn't take the responsibility off of me. In fact, it gives me the opportunity to continue to surrender to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And let that, uh, that labor of love work through me. Love is a direct counter to hate. And just as hate is contagious, so is love. We're carriers. But is what we're carrying worth catching? Our third one is hope. We're to cultivate hope. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians again. Chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> hope in the Lord Jesus Christ awakens the church to endure its work and labor, its work of faith and its labor of love. It's hope that, that awakens that in us. It's hope that drives us. It's a patient hope that pushes us. The word patience comes from a Greek word that means endurance, steadfastness, perseverance. It helps us to go places that we never could have gone before. It, it motivates us. It pushes us. It drives us. It strengthens us. To be able to do what we never thought possible. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. We know he's going to guide us and, and strengthen us and provide for us and sustain us and deliver us and bless us. But, but that's, not a, that's not all of it. So, so I know James says life is but a vapor. It appears for a moment and then vanishes away. And, and God, God is, you know, he, he's blessing us in the midst of the vapor. He's, uh, our hope is not just for life, but life more abundantly. Okay, John 10, 10. But that's not all he does. If that was all that there was, if all that there was to hope for was what can be found in this life, 
Well, Paul said we would be of most men miserable. But there's more. <laughs> we know that the Lord is going to call us home to heaven one day. And I don't know about you. I suspect this about you. But I cannot wait to see his face in the flesh. I cannot wait to walk the streets of heaven. I cannot wait to audibly hear the voice of my Savior saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I cannot wait. I love life. I truly do. And I try to live it to its fullest. But God offers more. And that's where our patience of hope is. We have a place reserved for us. If we know Christ as Lord and Savior, we have a place reserved for us. Not some uh, um, ethereal, cloudy place where we turn into these fat little cherubs with little tiny wings and, and strumming a harp all day long. That's not any version of heaven that makes any sense at all. If you read through the Bible, you realize that heaven is, it, it's, this, it, it's, it's, a, it's a place that's real. It's a place that has blessings where there's no tears, no sorrow, no pain, no anguish, no anxiety, no, no, uh, no turmoil, no chaos. It's packed with everything that is good from God. And he is the center citizen and ruler of this place. And we get to see him. And that's the hope that he talks about here. The, the church of Thessalonica... They didn't go to church. They were the church because they had a hope for heaven. They knew that they were able to endure the affliction that came with being believers and do it in joy because they had this hope for heaven. First Peter says this. In chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to what? To be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here, here verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Did you hear that? It can't be touched. It's not going to rust. It's not going to, to decompose. It's not going to fade away. It's what's waiting for us. And verse 5 goes on to say, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Okay. So, so what, what uh, uh, is, is being told here? What is, what is Peter saying to us here? He's saying, you might face some tough times. It's not always going to be uh, uh, um, rainbows and, and unicorns and, and, and ice cream and, and wonderful, happy things. It's not always going to be like that. He says, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be trials. And we're facing them today in our world. You turn on the news and... It makes you think that the world has lost its mind. Some of the things that are being said, some of the things that are being done on all ends, from all sides, makes you think, has the world completely lost its mind? And you know what the answer to that is? Absolutely. Because the world system is different than the body of Christ. Peter says, yeah, you're going you're gonna to face some rough times, but be patient. Be patient, because this too will end. And heaven waits for those that know him. Hope is the direct counter to worry and anxiety. And just as worry is contagious, you ever notice how worry can be contagious? Somebody gets a little worried, and then you don't even know what's going on. All of a sudden, you start getting a little anxious. You're like, what's going on? Just like worry is contagious, so is hope. And we're carriers. And we're contagious. Is what you're carrying, is what I'm carrying, is it worth catching? I heard uh, chaos and the trouble of our world, uh, troubles of our world described as the university of adversity. 
You ever hear that? The university of adversity. And we're all in this university. We're all students in the university of adversity. But in that university, what is God trying to teach us? See, that's the perspective. I know some people say, I'm in this university of adversity. Why is God doing this to me? We should be asking, what is God trying to teach us? Because when things are dark, when things are rough, when things are in turmoil, when chaos reigns, it gives us an opportunity to be contagious on the other end, the opposite end, the antivirus to all of this. Chaos is contagious. It's a storm. A storm where we can activate our faith, demonstrate our love, and cultivate our hope. I want to tell you a story about uh, the island of uh, Molokai. Any, any of you heard of the island of, of Molokai? It's, um, it's an island in Hawaii, and it's got quite the history. Back in the 1800s, uh, there was no cure for leprosy. There is now, so you, so I see some of you, so you, you know where I'm going with this, right? Th there is now, but back then there, there was not. It was a horrible, horrible disease. Totally ruined lives and extremely contagious. So in order to keep the disease at bay, in order to keep it from spreading, and creating a pandemic, uh, the government would send the, the lepers to a, a colony on the island of Molokai. And they would be secluded and isolated. Well, in 1873, there was a, a young man named Damien, a young priest named Damien. Uh, he volunteered to spend his life there serving the people, knowing that living in such close proximity to such a contagious disease was probably going to mean he was going to catch it. He knew that, but he went anyway. And what he saw there shocked him. He saw people who were not only suffering physically, but socially, emotionally, and spiritually as well. In the leper colony, he saw extreme drunkenness and immorality and, and abuse. Uh, there was an overall sense of hopelessness. And when he saw these people... Uh, he, he desperately wanted to get them the, the answer to their question. Their question was, where is God in all of this? And he wanted to give them the answer. So uh, he, he did that. He spent his, his life there. In, in 1873, he lived among the 700 lepers that were in this colony. And he built hospitals and clinics and churches and 600 coffins in his time there. All the while, giving them hope, trying to answer the question, where is God in this? Uh, showing them his faith, showing them his love, giving them hope the whole time. Whenever a church service was held, he would stand up in front of the lepers and he would, say, he would warmly and lovingly say, uh, um, my dear brethren, and then he would start. But one morning in 1885, at the age of 45, he stepped up to the, to the pulpit again in a, in a calm, clear voice. Instead of him saying, my dear brethren, he began with, my fellow lepers, I am now one of you. He contracted the disease. Leprosy is highly, highly contagious. But so is faith, hope, and love. And the people on that island were carriers. And Damien caught what they, what they had, but they also caught what he had. And the entire colony was transformed through his contagion, through what he was carrying. He caught what they had, and he died from it. But they caught what he had, and they lived forever from it. Changes everything. Paul closes a section in, uh, to the Thessalonians in, in these words, in, in verses 7 and 8. He says, you became an example of all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth where? Everywhere. Everywhere. In the midst of the chaos these people were so contagious that everybody heard about their faith, 
their love and their hope. <laughs> I suspect that if it wasn't so chaotic, that it would not have spread like that. I suspect that if it wasn't so dark, they would not have shined as brightly as they did. I suspect that it was just this affliction, just this contagion, this chaos that allowed them to rise and be the church and make a difference. I want to be like that. I want to be that, that child of God that is so stinking contagious in my love and, and in my hope and in my faith that it's just, it's just complete, it's contagious. Remember, um, remember the Peanuts, Peanuts cartoons? Remember Pigsty? Is that what his name was? Pigsty? Pigpen. Not Pigsty, Pigpen. My dad used to say my room was a Pigsty, but this was Pigpen. Right? And he'd walk around, and, and you always knew he was coming. Why? There was this big cloud of smoke around him, all dirt and fleas and dust and stuff like that. I want to be that. My wife's like, oh, I don't think so, tough guy. I don't want to be that with the dirt and the nap. I want to be contagious. I want the love of Christ. I want the faith that he's given me. I, I want the hope that he's built in my heart. I want that to be so contagious that people can't help but catch what I'm carrying. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's close our eyes. You and I are carriers. We can't deny that. We can't fight that. We're carriers, but is what we're carrying worth catching? I'll tell you this. If you have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've placed your faith, your hope, and your trust in him and him alone, you are contagious. But we've got to walk in it. We've, it's got to become real in us. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have not trusted him yet, well, you're still contagious, but you're not contagious with these things. You're not contagious with the, the love and the, the faith and the hope of Christ. But you can be. My Bible says today is the day of salvation. My Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. I don't care if you've gone to church for 100 years and given all of your life's uh, uh, resources to good charity. I, that, that's good. Those things are nice. They're not, they're not bad things. But they don't get you to heaven. My Bible says there is only one way to heaven. And it's not religion. And it's not a church. And it's not a system of good works. It's Christ and Christ alone. He said, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. You say, well, how does, a, how does God become the door to God? That was the hard part. He had to take on flesh. He became one of us, but without sin. And went to the cross and paid our sin debt. On that cross. So that as we trust in him. And have place, place our faith in him. He adds to our account. His purity. His good works. His sinlessness. And then when we stand before God in heaven. Because our account is filled with him. We get to have heaven forever. And if you're here and you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, my friend, now is the time. You cannot wait. We don't know if we have tomorrow. And if God has spoken to you today and through his word and you want to trust, you want to be sure of a home in heaven, you can trust in Jesus Christ right now. You can respond. He's done all the work. You can call upon the name of the Lord as the Bible says. And the way you do that is you pray. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's not a magic prayer, but, but if, if you want to trust in Jesus Christ right now, if God has spoken to you right now, you can say something like this. Say it from your heart. You can say, Lord, I'm not perfect. I have messed up. I have sinned. Then you can say this. You can say, Lord, I, I don't necessarily understand it all, but I do want you, and I do want heaven. So right now, as best as I know how, I turn from my sins. I turn to you. I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Come into my life and save my soul. 
Now everyone's heads are bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. My Bible says if you responded to the offer of salvation from God just now, like that, my Bible says you're a new creature. My Bible says your name is written in heaven and it cannot be taken out. My Bible says all of heaven rejoices right now at what you just did. And I would love to pray for you right now and throughout the week. I'm not going to make you jump up and down. I'm not going to make you stand up. I'm not going to call out your name. I'm not going to bring any attention. This is really between you and God, but I would like to get in on it. Simply, I would like to pray for you. So if you just pray that prayer with me, could you do me a favor without anyone else looking around? Could you raise your hand? You can put it right back down. You just pop it up and put it right back down. I just want to see who you are so I can keep you in my prayers. Did you just call upon the name of the Lord? Did you, did you trust in Jesus just now as Lord and Savior? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here. We are yours. We know it's not a religion. We know it's not a church thing. It's, it's beyond that. We know it's a relationship with you, walking by faith, loving those that are around us, and being patient in our hope. Help us to be contagious, but help us to carry what's worth catching. We love you so very much. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.